Hi, everybody. So today we're here to do our March and April entertainment review, wrapping up things we've watched or read since our last video. Since our last video on March 16th. Uh, so actually, we wanted to start off this conversation by opening with a question that my cousin Olivia asked on her podcast, what makes you March mad? So, uh, like, that's a combination of two questions. What what makes for like what makes you march mad for angry and what makes you m march mad for happy? So, what what's your answer? For me, making it march happy is knowing that we are in springtime, and but unfortunately, what some of you may make you sad or angry was that we still have the snow, especially up here this weekend. Um, and one thing that makes me March mad, like on the happy side, is that my artwork that I made, that is a picture of a quote from Fool's Rush Inn, sh sold at my art show, um, that was at the beginning of March, that I missed due to illness, this was the day before we left for New York City, so I'm very excited to add a bit more money into my bank account. Um, and then for mad, mad things that make me mad, I would say uh, it has to be all of the paparazzi following around the royal family and not giving Princess Kate the privacy that she needs to be with her family uh, and deal with her cancer diagnosis. I understand that the public of London needs to be aware of what's going on, but I don't think the press needs to be constantly in their faces because, I mean, as you know, this is what exactly led to Princess Diana dying. She died in a car crash in 1997, getting away from the obsessive paparazzi who were trying to ask her questions when she didn't want to talk to them. So it just really aggravates me. And what makes you march mad as an angry mad? Well, for something that makes me angry during the month of March is sometimes that I have to deal with that we're getting into spring, but sometimes our finances and what we do for our tax returns we get less money in return than we actually think we are going to. Plus the job that I have, which involves uh, traffic, I do get most of that paid, which is not the taxes. So when come tax season, sometimes my money gets taken away because of that. It gets taken away because of your tax refund? Yes. That's weird. Okay, on to entertainment. So, um, we saw two plays back to back this weekend Peter and the Star Catcher at Portland Players and Mean Girls, where uh, at Thornton Academy. My cousin Juliana was in Mean Girls in the ensemble. She is a junior at Thornton Academy. So, we will get to Mean Girls in just a minute. First and Thornton one, Academy is located in Saco, Maine on Route 1. And it's a very nice school. It seems to me like it's a private school similar to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. So first of all, we wanted to talk about Peter in the Starcatcher. We have seen this once previously at the Amato Center back before COVID-19. I believe it was in fall 2018 that Riverbend Youth Company did this for their fall show. Um, so basically what this show is, is it's a play with music. So... It's not a musical, it's just a play that has like short songs in between scenes, not long, drawn out musical numbers with tap dancing and all that. So this is a prequel to Peter Pan, and we decided to talk about this play in conjunction with our series of talking about uh, live action and animated Disney movie comparisons. So... Basically, Peter and the Starcatcher tells the story of Molly Astor, who is the grandmother of Jane and Michael, Jane and, not Jane, that's Mary Poppins, Wendy, Michael, and John Darling from Peter Pan. And Peter Pan 
also appears in this story, but his character's name is Boy, and then he, and then as the story goes along, he gets the name of Peter Pan. So, um, the actors in this play were really talented. Um, the people who stood out to me, and I don't know if you agree or not, were um, Prentice, who is played by Penelope Johnson, um, Ma um, Carly Allen, who played the lead character of Marley Ast uh, Astor. And the duo uh, of both Smee and Gregor is played by Genevieve Barikbach. She was the one who actually let Jeannie and I in when we were entering for our roles as ushers. Oh, that was Genevieve? Okay. I didn't make that connection. And then my other favorite character was Black Stash, who is supposed to be Captain Hook, and he was played by <coughs> Tom Holzauer. So this group, this theater group has um, is right down the street from us, and they have already announced their season for next year, which we're really excited about. They are doing Legally Blonde, the musical, Into the Woods, The Lion, Witch, and the, the wardrobe. wardrobe, and Fun Home. So we are thinking of auditioning for either Legally Blonde or Into the Woods. And if you have audition song recommendations for us, I am a mezzo-soprano and you are what? A baritone, a baritone bass. baritone bass. So, um, I don't really have any dream roles for Legally Blonde, but if I could pick one, it would probably be one of the sorority sisters in El Sorority. And then for Into the Woods, my fav my dream role is probably one of Cinderella's stepsisters, because Stepsisters Lament is a very funny song. So, um, the next show we are going to be helping out with at Portland Players is Mary Poppins in June, which is very exciting because the last time we were in Mary Poppins was at the Amato Center in 2015 and it's one of our favorite shows. So we're very excited to be involved in our favorite show again. Now we wanted to talk about Mean Girls. We already reviewed the musical version of the movie that was theatrically out in the movie theaters in January, but we wanted to talk about the musical. Um, the play, the musical, has very similar songs. Actually, most of the songs in the movie and the musical are the same, but there were a couple of songs that we were disappointed that were in the musical that were not in the that, that are in the play that weren't in the movie version of the musical. Um, the song that I really liked was called Stop. And that was the tap number with Damien and the ensemble basically telling people to think about what you post before you post stuff on social media, which I think is a very timely message for everybody in this internet age. Um, and as we mentioned when we reviewed the movie version of Mean Girls, our other favorite songs are Stupid with Love, Apex Predator, um, Revenge Party, and I'd Rather Be Me. And the other song that was not in the movie version of the musical was um, Whose House Is This, which is the song... That is when Caddy has the big party at her house. Um, and our the standout performances, this whole cast of um, my cousin Juliana and her classmates were very talented. We were impressed, and we were impressed to look in our program and see that a lot of the lead characters were underclassmen. Um, the lead girl who played Katie Heron, she was she's only a sophomore. She's incredibly talented. Her name is Emma. Eutychus. Eutychus. And who played Regine, uh, named Daphne Blank. Uh, she really had a good talent, too. And in the previous uh, films of Mean Girls, both uh, Rachel McAdams and Renee Rapp, who played uh, the title of Regina, they had blonde hair, but Daphne had brunette hair. So it goes to show that it doesn't take a girl with the same hair color to play a specific role. All it just takes is the right character and the talent. Our other favorite characters were Janice, who was played by Lily Lavery, who is a who is a a sophomore. A sophomore. Cameron Turgeron, who is a senior, he played Damien. Olivia Duby, who is a sophomore, she played Karen, and Mrs. George. Uh, 
who was played by Abby Burnham, who's a sophomore. And another shout out we were really impressed by that we wanted to give her the was the project for the projections manager who did all the digital scenery. Mm -hmm. Her name was Abby Lizotte and she is a junior. So congratulations to the cast crew and production team of Mean Girls at Thornton Academy and Peter and a star catcher at Portland players on amazing performances. Um, and because we enjoyed uh, at Thornton Academy, Jean and I may be going back there for other future shows. Mean Girls has two more performances today, and Peter in the Star Catcher runs until next weekend, next Sunday at two. Um, so if you are in Portland and you have the opportunity to, to go see Peter in the Star Catcher or Portland players, do not miss it. Okay, so next up, we are going to talk about the live action movie and animated movie comparisons for Peter Pan. So in a previous review video that we did last year or the year before, I can't remember when exactly, we have previously reviewed both animated versions of Peter Pan, the original animated movie from 1953, mm -hmm. and the sequel, Peter Pan 2 Return to Neverland from 2001. And the two live action versions of Peter Pan we wanted to talk about today are Hook, which came out in 1990... 1991. 1991, and starred... Robin the, Williams the as Peter Pan. Robin Williams as Peter Pan, and Julia Roberts as Tinkerbell. Um, so, one thing that we... The main thing that we liked about Hook was that, of course... Robin, it was one of Rob, to us, it was one of Robin Williams' most iconic roles besides the genie in Aladdin, Mrs. Delphire and Mrs. Delphire, and the teacher in Dead Poet Society. Now, the main concept of uh, the movie Hook was Peter himself, who was, had the misconception of now being a grown up. And when you're grown up, sometimes you forget what, uh, your childhood past was really like. So in this case, he discovers after a recent trip back to Neverland that he was Peter Pan. Okay. Um, and the other recent Peter Pan live action movie that we have watched was Peter Pan and Wendy, which came out last winter on Disney Plus. And... <coughs> <coughs> It's a more like modernized version of Peter Pan. Um, and there there are a few things that stood out to us about this film that makes it different from the animated version. The first one is that... They don't have the songs. Right. They, the songs, You Can Fly and Following the Leader, were just instrumental and not words with lyrics, which was a deterrent because we love those songs and we love the lyrics to the songs. So we hated the fact that the lyrics were omitted. And also another thing was Neverland is more like a reality place that is located in the British Isles. Cause I was thinking more of the Greenlands of Ireland since I've been there before myself. Um, and the other thing that we thought was cool about Peter Pan and Wendy was the fact that, the Native American characters were more culturally appropriated because in the cartoon from the 1950s, they are mostly relegated to stereotypes, which are quite offensive. So that is the one thing we do not like about the animated version of Peter Pan is that they are very... The Native American characters are very culturally offensive and would not fly today in the way they were depicted. Um, a, one thing more... A couple things more. Um... So, one book that I recently read that's related to Peter Pan is called Never by Jessa Hastings. This was talked about by Sarah Caroli and Rachel Catherine on their YouTube channels. And it is a modern day version of Peter Pan where Peter Pan takes Wendy's granddaughter back to Neverland. And is her name Daphne? The character, yes. The, the 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 lead character's name in this book is Daphne. She is the granddaughter of Wendy Darling, and I would assume the daughter of 
Wendy's daughter Jane from Peter Pan 2 Return to Neverland. So I had to stop reading this book 200 pages in. It's nothing against Jessica Hastings' writing. Her writing is fantastic and very descriptive, and I felt like I was in Neverland. The thing that turned me off about this book was Daphne's character. She was a brat, and I could not stand her, and I could not tolerate her. And also, there's a little hint that Peter Pan was going to have sex with an underage girl, which is gross. So, um, It's also illegal because of the child pornography things that we hear about. Right. And Justin Hastings, for those who don't know, is the same author as the Magnolia the Magnolia Park series, which also the booktubers have all talked about on their channels. Magnolia Parks has been described by the booktubers as Gossip Girl in London, but from the descriptions of the characters of Magnolia and BJ, I lean towards seeing them more as Rachel and Ross from Friends, but they could also be BJ and not BJ. Oh, what's his name? Chuck and Blair from Gossip Girl. It's just that I'm more of a friends person than Gossip Girl. I never watched Gossip Girl. And the last point we wanted to make about Peter Pan is the cookbook recipe. Um, mm -hmm. The Disney cookbook recipe that we made related to Peter Pan is called Mushroom Medley. It's basically um, mushrooms that we put on top of pasta. And we gave that dish an 8.5 out of 10. And now, the recipe calls for shallots and onion and garlic and also some heavy cream but if you don't want to have heavy cream because it's a little bit fattening you can leave it out and make sure you put some white wine to create a nice uh, effect after you drowse the flavor that makes it a little sweet and you can put it on top of pasta and you don't have to add any salt or any extra once you taste it Okay, so now that we have closed the chapter on reviewing uh, Disney live action and animated movie comparisons, our next movie discussion series for the next couple of videos will be Oscar nominated movies. Um, so for previous videos, we have reviewed Barbie and Elemental. And what did you like the best about Barbie? What I liked the best about Barbie was discovering who she really is when she finds out uh, about the person who created her. Yes, and I, I, that's the part that I really liked the best about Barbie too, other than America Ferrera's monologue that she gives to Barbie about being a strong woman. Um, I have said in previous videos that that monologue should be on merchandise for the movie um and by the way barbie the original doll was created in 1959 and for 80s for fans of 80s tv shows rhea perlman who was in cheers plays the character of the creator of barbie who makes a cameo in a few scenes in the movie um the next oscar animated movie we wanted to mention was elemental which we watched last winter or last fall and it was a new release last year around the time and it's basically an immigrant story slash romeo and juliet retelling but instead of like people for characters they use the elements so they have the fire kingdom which is the main female character her name's ember and then the water the water colony so kind of think about like Avatar The Last Airbender and how they have kingdoms for air, fire, water, and land, or I don't remember what the kingdoms are, but an elemental is the same way, only there's a fire kingdom and a water kingdom. And the main character, the main male character, who's supposed to be Romeo, Wade, is in the water kingdom. And what did you like best about Elemental? I just thought the animation and creation of those elements were very useful, and I caught on with the difference between opposites attract. I did too. Um, so we gave Elemental a B plus, and the other Disney, the other we are actually 
for this review series, we are reviewing current Oscar nominated movies and backlogged Oscar nominated movies from the past couple of years that we didn't get to watch before we moved here. So one movie we recently watched that was nominated for the 2022 Oscars was called Flea, which was nominated for three Oscars that year. Um, animated feature, documentary, and foreign film. And the what did you like the best about Flea? What did you like the best about Flea? I liked how they made it in that animation where it was almost a uh, stop action with hand drawings combined with the uh, animation to look almost realistic. I agree. That's what Plus I Plus like. it also told a realistic story about uh, immigrants from Afghanistan where they eventually <laughs> ended up in Scandinavia, Europe. Me too. That is what I liked about Flea as well. And we gave Flea a B minus. So for books, right now I am reading Killers of the Flower Moon, which is the basis of the movie that was nominated for the Oscar um, this year. And we are going to be reviewing this movie next month. And as far as the book goes, I am really enjoying it so far and finding it very interesting and engaging. I am on page... You're starting chapter 19 on... I'm on page 197. I just finished chapters... I just finished chapter 18. So, um, next we are going to talk about uh, TV episode reviews. So let me just switch my papers. Um, so, for today's video, we are reviewing two episodes of Cougar Town... Two episodes of The Muppet Show, one episode of The Golden Girls, and one episode of The Office. So we are going to start with Cougar Town. The first Cougar Town episode that we are reviewing today is from season two. It's episode eight. You don't know how it feels. And this is the episode where Courtney Cox's character, Jules, her dad, comes to visit. And um, we are to notice that there uh, is tension between them. And it was then explained in another episode we recently watched called Cry to Me, when Jules is trying to get Grayson to open up about being emotional about his dad dying, that, his, that Jules' mother died. But what is not really explained very well is how old... <laughs> Jules was when her mother died and why there was so much like if the tension between her and her father had been going on for a while um that was it that was not explained and that was very confusing so it is very unlikely that Courtney Cox will see this video but if she does if she could answer that question, that would be good. But And a couple other points about the episode was, it was around Halloween. So Travis think, thought he was too old to dress up for it. Did you think you were too old to dress up for Halloween at 19? Oh, I was even too old to look like I was going to be dressed up even when I was 13. Because you were too tall? I was all too tall, yes. <laughs> so, um... I actually stopped dressing up for Halloween at in high school, but then when we had Halloween costume parties at the pub in NEC, I did dress up a few times. But mostly I stopped dressing up as a teenager because I didn't think it was cool anymore. Um, what were your favorite Halloween costumes? I had one where I had dinosaur, crocodile, Batman, and football player. Uh, well, let's see. And I remember my senior year when we had our school dances. I think I dressed one time as Elvis. Ooh, that's fun. Let's see. What were my favorite Halloween costumes? Um, gee. One year, I think I dressed up as Princess Jasmine from Aladdin. And then my little sister was Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. um, then my freshman year of high school, I was Christina Aguilera. Um... What else did I dress up as for Halloween? 
Oh, I don't even remember. But I, I, as a kid, my mother helped me design my Halloween costumes, and she was always great at picking out good stuff to wear. So right. I have tons of pictures and old photo albums that I wish I had with me here to show you, but I don't. But yes, growing up, I definitely had a ton of great Halloween costumes that were very memorable. Now let's go down to four episodes later. Number 12 called A Thing About You. Right. So in this episode, Lori, who is played by Busy Phillips, is jealous of Jules because she spends more time with Grayson. And she spends the weekend at her house. Um, and yes, Lori does come off as a bit annoying in this episode and um, she does overstep a few of Jules's boundaries and I have been responsible of mm -hmm. overstepping people's boundaries and I own up to that. So I can definitely relate to Lori's behavior in this episode because I've done it before, mm -hmm. but I can also relate to Jules and how she has to set boundaries because I mean, it's understandable that she would have to do that because I've had to do it too. So in this particular case, I can relate to either of the two female characters. And then we go to the office here. And season two, episode 19, is called Michael's Birthday. So in this episode, Michael is planning his birthday party with the rest of his co-workers. And before they find out that Michael is planning his birthday party, Kevin, who is played by Brian Baumgartner finds out that he has skin cancer and um basically all of the other pe all of the other people in the office are really rallying around Kevin because he's really upset about his diagnosis and they're not really paying attention to Michael about the plans for his birthday party because they're all worried about Kevin and he's I hate Michael in this episode because he's really self-centered he should be also showing that he cares for Kevin, but he doesn't. All he talks about in the little sidebar things when the camera pans away from Krause's is how he had horrible birthday parties as a kid and how he felt that people never respected him on his birthday when in the present time he's in, one of his friends is going through a really difficult time and he's not really understanding about that at all because he is too focused on himself. Now, Gene and I both have had uh, birthday parties, which we remember very well, whether it be our milestone for our age or something else. Mostly milestone for age, because my top three memorable birthdays are age 16, when I went to see NSYNC. That was when they were performing before the old stadium became Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. 30, when we had the hot... Wait, wait a minute. Yeah. That was the Hull House. Yeah, thirty when we had the thirty when we had the party down hall and then um Oh, there was one more, wasn't there? Maybe it hasn't happened yet. So okay, there were two for me. But I'm sure there were a couple of others that I'm not remembering. I remember right a lot of my previous birthdays, especially when my father used to videotape uh my first ten. My very first birthday, boy, how time has flown by. Our kitchen looked a lot different in Burlington compared to other years, and I was already walking. My favorite birthday <laughs> party from when I was younger, still living in Massachusetts, was when I think, I don't remember what age I was turning, but the theme was The Little Mermaid, and we had a lot of fun games based around Under the Sea. I think I was like... You turned five. Thank you. I don't know how you remember that, but for some reason I can't. Um, so another book review I wanted to talk about. I just finished this. So Jenna Fish's memoir is called The Actor's, Survi the Actor's Life, Sur A Survival Guide. And I just need to say, not only is this book interesting with good, insightful information about Jenna Fisher's career as a TV actress, but it also provides good tips on how to deal with rejection from auditions, which I have had issues with in the past, and also good tips for writing resumes, which may help me if I need to write a resume for Portland players. I'm not sure if they require one for the auditions, but 
That's something I need to email people at the theater and ask. But if you are looking for a good um, book to read that provides good, insightful information for actors, please pick this book up and read it. Jenna Fisher's writing is engaging and informative and insightful. Five stars. Okay, another TV show we want to review for an episode is The Golden Girls. And this one is called Blind Ambition. So in this episode of The Golden Girls, Rose's sister comes to visit. Her name is Lily, and she's blind. And this this gives good representation of what people who have vision disabilities deal with, with like issues with their sight. As somebody who's blind myself, one se partially blind, a one pers one scene that stood out to me in this episode of the Golden Girls was the scene when she's cooking in the kitchen and she starts a fire. That scene is like me because I I get nervous cooking in the kitchen, especially in the stove, because I'm worried that I'm going to start a fire like Lily did. So. And after making it through some struggles, at the very end, Lily gets a a guard dog to help her. Mm-hmm. And the final episode reviews we want to point out today are two from the Muppet Show. The two Muppet Show episodes we wanted to review today are the one with Raquel Welch and the one with Harry Belafonte understanding each other. Um, Miss Mojo talked about the Harry Belafonte episode in their video where they talked about the Muppet Show covering serious issues. And the the serious issue that they talked about in their video was call, was about respecting other people's cultural differences, which I think is very important, especially in this time, because we go through the whole issue with Black Lives Matter and everything like that. So I think that was an important message, but a message that should have probably been mentioned in the video that wasn't, that we figured we would talk about, is writer's block. Uh, that's, that's right. That's it's he, that it's character Fozzie who was trying to type up a script for the show itself. He was having trouble getting thoughts in his head on, on the old typewriter. How many of you have ever thought about writing stories or scripts and you just didn't have it uh, in front of your eyes or you couldn't think about it? That's writer's block. That has happened to me numerous times. And how I deal with it is I either step totally away from what I'm writing and go do something else or I get out my journal and I do a couple of writing prompts to help me get out of my slump and then I go back to what I'm reading or I talk to other people about advice about how I can deal with that scene. And, and one other thing I want to point out with uh, the Harry Belfonte episode the opening script uh, was his most iconic song, the Banana Boat song. Which is a fun song to sing at karaoke. And what happens is, even though you hear the antics of the Muppets and it's typical zany behavior, Harry is that type of was that type of person who just kept it going very smoothly with the song. Now, Harry Belfonte is one of those few actors who not only was on The Muppet Show, but he also was once on Sesame Street. And it happened in like the early 1980s. He was doing this coconut uh, counting song with the count. Right. And he was uh, doing the main lyrics and the count was the counting man co counting the coconuts. It's a lot of fun. And I liked how they were both happy and very end, the Count gave him a coconut to show respect. And then the other episode of The Muppet Show that we watched was the one with Raquel Welch. The reason why we picked these episodes of The Muppet Show to review was because Raquel Welch and Harry Belafonte both died last year. And we wanted to watch these episodes to, to remember what made them such great performers and the musical number that Raquel Welch does with, with, with Miss Piggy is called I'm a Woman and it's such a fun 
it's such a fun song and I might actually try to sing that at karaoke next time I go. Uh, it's by Peggy Lee. That's actually how the character Miss Piggy got her name. By Raquel Welch? No, by Peggy Lee. Oh, I didn't know that. Now, also in the episode with Raquel, you you could see that there was a poster for one of her more iconic movies in the late 1960s called Million Years B.C. Right. And she's also she also was in another movie with one of the former Beatle members, Ringo Starr, called The Magic Christian. Which I've never seen or heard of. i never seen it myself, but I've heard of it. Oh, cool. Okay, well, that is it for today. Our next video will be on uh, May 19th. And we will have more mentions about these TV episodes and movies. And then next weekend, Jeannie and I are going to be seeing Matilda. And we would like to have, we would like to say before we sign off, um, happy opening night on Friday to our friends in Matilda, and we cannot wait to see you on Saturday. Have a great run. See you folks later.